Ashley. I direct Westmont's Katie Institute for the Liberal Arts um, and co sponsor for today's event. Um, I also share in the leadership of Westmont in Northern Europe with the magnificent Dr. Sherry Larson Heckling. Um, two years ago, Sherry and I hosted a dinner for four scholars from around the world who were here as part of a seminar at UCSB on religious diversity in America. And who knew what would open up before us as a result of that delightful, laughter-filled evening. Among our guests was a scholar in human geography from Bratislava, Slovakia. We got to talking about the fact that Sherry and I would be taking students to Central Europe that fall. Um, and uh, this new friend said, why not come to Bratislava? If I had been honest, I would have replied, because I have no idea where Bratislava is. <laughs> <laughs> but on reflection, that was actually the exact reason to accept this invitation. Sherry and I love taking students to lesser known places having long since discovered that that provides much more opportunity for discovery. So we did, and a friendship was born. Dr. Maya has been an outstanding interpreter of Slovakian history, culture, and society now for two years of Westmont and Northern Europe, and for a third upcoming fall. And he has introduced our students to a fascinating and quickly beloved part of the world. This year, he's had something uh, even more to offer, I should say. With the influx into Europe of those seeking refuge from parts of the world in crisis, especially uh, South Central Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, uh, we have found Yure to be an outstanding and tremendously helpful conversation partner about the European response to the influx of refugees. And that, of course, is what we'll be treated to today, is his reflections and insights on that European response. Dr. Mayo holds a PhD in human geography and demography from Comenius University in Bratislava, which I now know where it is. Um, he works there now as an assistant professor. His research and teaching interests include human demography, geography, demography of religions and ethnicities, cultural geography, and computer mapping. And I assure you, we are in for a real treat of tremendous insights today from Dr. Maya. So please welcome with me Dr. Yura Maya. So first of all, I would like, and it's, it's appropriate to do that at the beginning, I would like to thank Cherry and Chris Hockley for organizing this whole week. It's been very tremendous interest to meet very interesting and inspiring people so far. Uh, and I've always got, inter uh, it's always very interesting for me to, to guide the groups they bring each year to Europe and to see how these young people react to the place that, as I'm citing, Chris once was a uh, land of the enemy. And uh, what is very inspiring for me, or very uh, interesting to see how uh, these two people, the Sherry and Chris, uh, keep the group together <laughs> in a, as a cohesive group and uh, together with their almost parental care for the students, they form a really, really interesting group and nobody would ever find out that they are already, for, uh, already on their waves, on their waves for several weekends, several weeks for several days, so I hope uh, we will have more opportunities to, to welcome you in this very specific part of the world. And one more time, thank you very much. So, uh, as Chris has mentioned, uh, the very topical issues of this day you might be reading and listening and watching on TV uh, is the issue of the refugees or general, the sudden uh, increase in numbers of refugees that appeared mostly in the European continent and mostly uh, in its uh, southeastern part, or maybe southern or southeastern part. Uh, 
maybe from the point of from the geographical point of view and your perspective this topic might seem a little remote to you but from the cultural point of view i think uh, it is very close to you and uh, close to the the things you study here at the at the college and you have studied already uh, during your education so uh, i would like to maybe uh, point at certain aspects of this issue that uh, in Europe we are encountering these days. Uh, first of all, uh, we must realize that Europe is unfortunately not, uh, it's, uh, is not anonymous in this topic. So there, are, there is not one general, uh, general way they should work or one general agreement how they should cope with the ideas. There are still some let's say, bad children, enfants terribles within Europe, including my own country. Uh, so I will maybe aim my presentation at the situation and the perception of these migration flows in this part of Europe that has uh, responded to this issue very specific, in a very specific and in a way that sometimes uh, causes some awkward moments. The thing is that I realized it uh, just later that probably the notion of Central Europe, what you have, is slightly different from mine. Am I right? We will see. <laughs> <laughs> what I perceive as a Central Europe, uh, let's say uh, from a political or geopolitical point of view, we can uh, set this region as the Eastern Central Europe. Uh, so I would not include the Germany or Austria that you would usually include in Central Europe. Uh, we usually consider in our geopolitical circumstances Central Europe as the countries uh, mostly consisting uh, of the so-called uh, Visegrad 4. Visegrad is a city in Hungary where there was a written or signed agreement in 1990 or the years after 1990 that would uh, bring closer cooperation between Poland, at that time Czechoslovakia and Hungary. So these are the four countries, now four countries, since 1993 there are four, before then there were three. These are the four countries that these days uh, undergo, let's say, almost similar or very, very similar uh, political changes, including the growth of, uh, let's say, populist movements, that uh, even have their representatives in national assemblies. There is the issue of uh, especially Hungary and Slovakia, unfortunately, after uh, the elections we had uh, in March, that in our national assemblies we have representatives of far-right parties, unfortunately. Partly it's a due and it's an issue of uh, of, it's, it's a reaction to the situation that emerged in Europe through, or, or, or through the year 2005, 2015. And cultures and societies shaped by fear. Uh, I will return to this quote maybe later. You probably have heard, maybe some of you have heard this quote. I think for me it's, it's kind of a notable quote that was presented by Angela Merkel, the German chancellor. Uh, especially when uh, she wanted to appease the situation, uh, especially during the fall in 2015, when there were really, uh, the situation was really stirred up and uh, people were not, people didn't know how to react properly. So now we can see that, uh, well, there is a general agreement or, or this data may show us on Conway that this immigration crisis uh, is one of the biggest immigration crises, or let's say it's, it's the, the crisis is aftermath of one of the biggest uh, immigration movements in this Euro-Asian space after the World War II. Uh, and there are several reasons that might have caused First of all, there are, there are lots of civil, civil uh, not lots of, but civil wars in many of these areas. Uh, one can point uh, its interest at climate changes. 
there are still politicians who deny that issue as an important issue, as, as an impetus for, for massive migration movements, as there are already several regions in the world where there is not enough, or after long-lasting long droughts, there is not enough food and resources for everybody, and it starts or it moves people uh, into the better, better conditions. And one of the most crucial questions that remains for us as the immigrants come, uh, what can we do and how can we separate the real refugees and how can we separate the immigrants from the economic point of view? It somehow, we can say it's like to separate the wheat from the chaff, to decide who shall enter and who shall stay ante portas. So uh, this is one of the most issues and uh, sometimes it seems that media try to aim on mostly at the economic aspects of the migrations that actually you can see in the media coverage uh, that uh, there are shoots of or, or the you can see in the news that most of the immigrants are portrayed as young men with very expensive uh, tablets or cell phones, well-dressed, and you might think that this somehow it doesn't fit to the stereotype uh, or the general uh, view or general uh, setting of a refugee. So besides this really hard question to decide who, shall, who can pass and who shall not pass or who can be entered, who can be allowed to enter who, and who cannot. If you're a politician in Europe, you have to take into account also that you have your, your voters. And you have to bring some message to them, so, and you have to keep or sustain uh, some electorate and some turnout for, for your parties. So this is a real dilemma that uh, in many countries, including uh, Central European countries, went its own direction and the, the reasons for or the aftermath are visible in our new political, geopolitical maps of Europe. Uh, therefore, after this, uh, mm, or generally the, the reaction to the, to the immigration process or illegal immigration, uh, was or became more known by the, 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 the term that becomes connected with Angela Merkel. It's called so Kovilkommens Kultur. Maybe you have heard of it. It's like a welcoming culture uh, that appeared also in the fall when uh, Angela Merkel wanted to, to solve the situation that in Greece, Italy, and in Hungary uh, suddenly appeared 20,000 immigrants and the states didn't know how to cope with them. Uh, so she declared an exception to the EU rules so they can freely pass from these countries to Germany to welcome them, which was not actually very nice. Uh, you can see what happened if we take into account the political preferences of specific, uh, specific uh, uh, political leaders in Germany. Uh, you can see the decline, especially uh, in the fall of Angela Merkel, and there is very visible or very uh, vivid correlation between the growth of immigrants in Germany and decline of uh, approval approval for Merkel's Angela Merkel's uh, act. So, if we would. So sum up the numbers, almost half a million applied in the first half and up to 800,000 were expected by the end of 2000, 2015. Uh, sometimes there might be some, uh, um, indications that Europe has already uh, experienced such migration crisis uh, in 1990s, at the beginning of 1990s, after the civil war in former Yugoslavia. There also were uh, sudden and uh, massive uh, immigrants of refugees or refugees from uh, former Republic of Yugoslavia. But somehow it seems that this situation uh, or 
states or, and politicians coped with this situation somehow more easily than with this. So, and not many times, uh, or probably is not even possible to really compare what happened in 1990s and 2015 and 16. Uh, but, is it, but is it interesting that uh, as Central Europe said, no, we, we don't want uh, any immigrants or we don't know the large number of immigrants. So it seems that the, the biggest players within this game remain in Europe, Sweden and Germany. Those were the countries that mostly or accepted the highest number of these sudden, suddenly emerged uh, refugees. And even those countries that we might perceive as open uh, had several troubles or has, uh, in these countries or in these societies, several issues emerged that somehow did not help or didn't make easier to accommodate and to accept these new immigrants. Somehow, maybe you have noticed the New Year's Eve attacks in Cologne, city of Cologne in, in uh, Germany. Some really kind of journalists that have a very vivid fantasy uh, titled this situation as Sex and the City, which is not very, very appropriate, I think. Uh, this was, these were the, the so-called like massive sexual attacks or sexual harassment attacks on people who were having fun welcoming New Year's, New, New Year. And people are asking uh, like uh, generally uh, if these sexual attacks on German women are incidents of a criminal scum or is just a normal way of normal reflection of Islamic culture. So these are the, the questions that arise or arise among uh, common people. And especially together if there were the terrorist attacks in Paris and Brussels. So these situations uh, or these uh, attacks did not make situation much easier, but on the other, uh, but uh, it made them more complicated. So what are the general demographic and geodemographic and geographic aspects? As you see, I like The Economist probably. It's a very good, a very good journal with very nice schemes it provides. Uh, so we can see there are uh, three major or three, three routes or migration routes that uh, have the highest probably media coverage. And you see the Eastern Mediterranean that goes through Greece and through the Aegean Sea or the sea with the lots of islands between Greece and Turkey. So the uh, islands usually serve or work as a detention areas for, for immigrants as they uh, are usually using the vessels of various quality and various stability and that's why lots of people, let's say almost more than several hundreds uh, have died on their way to Europe. There is the Western Balkans that go through Black Sea and through Romania and Bulgaria. They enter the European Union uh, and the Central Mediterranean that uh, goes also through the sea from, uh, especially from Africa. But these two, two Mediterranean routes are notably smaller than the biggest one that is the Eastern Mediterranean. There is one more Western Mediterranean, very small. And there is also one more that is only just several hundred people and probably it doesn't reach that high number at here, as here. It's the, it's the route that goes from Russia through Finland is the northern way. Only several hundred people succeeded to, to pass this, uh, to pass this uh, boundary and to enter European Union area. Uh, so for example, when I uh, return to that, to these uh, islands in Greece, for example, the Lesbos Islands were very famous uh, holiday destination. They have population of 85,000 and the number of uh, immigrants were at the same number. So suddenly they had to accept the twice, as, as, twice, as many as twice uh, people as they have or they inhabit the, the, the islands. So here is the, these were the, in 2015, uh, 
these are the, also the camps. I will return to some of the camps uh, that have recently very good made media coverage, especially the Idomeni camp. It's very famous in a negative point of view these days. Uh, and you see that there is the Lesbos bit, uh, very close to the, to the area of Turkey. So if we uh, continue with the demographic aspects, uh, besides the, uh, the fact that journalists and general public is asking that if there is real famine on war and war, why there are only young men uh, on refuge or running away. And the statistics of asylum uh, of European Union also proves very significantly that 75% of all immigrants are male almost 75%. Uh, you can check it on the website of European Statistical Office. At least it means all immigrants who applied for, for asylum in, uh, in the European Union. So, but mostly it's evident that they come from these from this, uh, flows, migration flows. Uh, so most of them are males, especially in the age of the productive age, so until 50. Only in the age of 65 and over, there is the domination of women, which is a general rule for populations, for populations where in older age there is a domination of, uh, of women. There is a, it's a general demographic law. One fourth of the all immigrants came from Syria, 11% are Afghani, 8% Iraqi, and uh, the age structure, especially the age 14 to 17. So here, I have mentioned uh, Greece and Italy, and I probably should come back to, to Europe. Uh, so not just the Greece and Italy, as they were the buffer zones for, for immigrants, uh, but also the Hungary as a first country within the EU. If you imagine then the Serbia with the Belgrade is not European Union country, and the first EU country uh, that is easily approachable because the land is flat, there are no mountains, no harsh conditions. So it's Hungary. Uh, and Hungary has a very specific position within Central Europe. Uh, as you might have heard, I think they were the first country in Central Europe that really had uh, representatives of far right in their parliament, so-called National Guard. You will see some pictures of, uh, of uh, their common assembly at the, the hero squares in Budapest. So. This was very in, the, the very interesting situation uh, emerged in Hungary and the reaction of the, the Prime Minister Viktor Orban was that he started to build a razor fence across the, or between the Serbia and Hungary. You will see later. So uh, the thing is that uh, on one side we have the immigrants from EU that enter the European Union and on, this, on the other side, we have uh, the European Union has systems or laws, internal laws that should deal with the immigrants, with the asylum applicants. But it's evident that when they were uh, tried to apply or write the laws, they did not took into uh, consideration such sudden emerge and the growth of immigrants. So for example, if I would cite the Dublin Declaration that really solves this situation, uh, for example, that asylum seekers must remain in the countries responsible, that are responsible for examining their asylum claims. Asylum seekers can apply for asylum, asylum only in EU country, in one EU country. And if they try to apply in more than uh, another country, they should be returned to the country of the first contact. So it would mean that all of the immigrants should have been returned to Greece, Italy, or maybe Hungary which is a nonsense and the, the, the populations or the, the, the leaders wouldn't agree with that. So that's why the EU wanted to, to introduce so-called, not equal, but the distribution of uh, immigrants according to either to GDP, the level of unemployment, the level of uh, accepted applicants from third countries. So they tried to, to separate that uh, or not to separate or try to create the, the rule according to which the immigrants should leave or, or should stay uh, in EU countries, which of course created opposition, especially in the countries of uh, Central Europe, like Poland, Czechia, Czech Republic, Czechia, Hungary, Slovakia, oppo opposed this. 
and uh, refused the system. Uh, I think even now today, the immigrants are still not uh, divided or they are not still resettled, all of them according to, to this law. Still there, is, there are some issues that needs to be solved for those who are already in the EU. Because at that moment, it meant that it should resettle 120,000 refugees. The thing is that uh, the implementation of or the abiding by the rules of Dublin agreements, they have to deny the Schengen agreements. Maybe you have heard of Schengen. Uh, Schengen is a system of uh, several European Union countries and also non-European Union countries that enter the Schengen, such as Norway or Switzerland. Uh, this is the agreement that uh, came into being in 18, 1985 and it meant that there should be the free flow of people, goods. So if you transfer uh, anything from another country to, to the next country legally, then uh, you do not have to wait at the boundaries, uh, boundary checking and so on. So it was uh, really made to make the situation easier. Uh, but it means that uh, the free movement uh, within the, e, the, the European Union is therefore very complicated, especially for immigrants. It would mean that if they enter the Schengen, they can travel all over the countries. But according to the Dublin, they should stay in the country of the first contact. So what to do? Uh, and you see that the most of the Europe, in excluding UK and Ireland, is uh, included with the, or it's a part of a Schengen area. So what to do with the 125 uh, refugees? So, uh, that was the, the, the biggest issue. Uh, how to cope and deal with, the, with the, the number of immigrants. So the situation in Europe, as, uh, or Central Europe, as uh, you, you, I have mentioned, became very complicated after that. On one side, lots of immigrants. On the, the second, or the second important point was that they refused the, the, the distribution of immigrants among countries. Uh, so this was the situation that, uh, especially in many countries, it was right before elections. So the situation became very complex. Uh, and especially the public, general public uh, opinion was very anti-immigrants. It has its cultural roots. The countries of Eastern Europe generally were very closed. After the World War II, uh, they were put in a cage beyond the, the cur Iron Curtain. And uh, the situation for them became somehow or evolved in a really different way as it evolved for Western countries. So the situation was like there were no immigrants, the population became stable and uh, there were also no, no, almost no internal migration even between the states of uh, so-called Soviet bloc. So the people are not used to, to see many immigrants, uh, actually. So even today, if you walk in the cities of Prague, Warsaw, Budapest or Bratislava, you usually see generally the white people or the white population apart from the populations of Germ big German cities or cities in uh, France or Netherlands or Belgium. So the situation uh, became very perplex. Thank for the economist for, <laughs> for this picture. As you see the, at the third place, the first man you probably know, yes. Uh, and the third one is uh, Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, who was honored to be become one of, to become the member of the group of the three biggest populists in the world. The second one you probably not very uh, known is uh, Marine Le Pen. It's a daughter of very famous ultranationalist politics, Jean Marie Le Pen. It's her daughter and usually she follows his steps. So she's not very different from his father. Uh, and then on the right side, you can see uh, the reaction of Hungary. Uh, how to prevent and how to stop the massive immigrations, immigration of uh, uh, refugees by building the razor, razor fans. Also, there is a controversy. On one side, they are the 
the edge country of Schengen zone and they are supposed to protect the zone. Yeah, to protect against anything that can uh, work against EU. But also we, we must see the human aspect of immigrants flowing and trying to get into EU. So they were usually, uh, the Hungarian governments were criticized for that topic. But uh, uh, the, the prime minister did not listen and really built in the second half of year 2015, he built the, the, the fence that was long 175 kilometers, which I converted to miles, 108 miles uh, between uh, Serbia and Hungary, and also between Hungary and Croatia. Hungary, Croatia, the green one, and the Serbia, that is the, bl the blue one. So they built a uh, uh, big fence, well, not big, relatively long fence uh, between those countries. But also Austria created checkpoints at the boundary between Slovenia and Austria just to, to make order in the immigration flows that would come to their countries. So somehow, even here we can see some indications that Austria became rather closer to the countries of Eastern Europe that really wanted to close off and to stop the flows of immigrants and uh, to change the situation. Uh, so maybe I would like to return to the, the, the title or the the lay or the f you have seen the title of the presentation at the beginning, the cultures shaped by fear. If I would quote it uh, completely, Angela Merkel said that it was a response to during a public discussion to a woman who asked what to do against uh, to prevent Islamization of Europe. And she responded like cultures and societies that are shaped by fear will without doubt not get a grip on the future. And uh, she also added that fear has never been a good advisor. And that was a very good description of the situation that could be used and transferred on uh, the situation in Central Europe. That really the decision of the politicians are really shaped by the fear by the fear of their own voters, of their own stereotypes, of their own uh, lack of knowledge, of their own lack of experience. Uh, but still, to defend this position or this standpoint, uh, if the people in Eastern Europe usually see that information, that the integration of uh, African and Asian people uh, failed in Western Europe, that there are ghettos growing uh, in suburb, suburb area, suburban area of many cities, that they are the, they were the nest of the future uh, Daesh fighters or the Islamic State fighters in the future. So these informations that were perceived and digested by people in Central Europe uh, really did not open their minds that would be welcoming such amount of uh, people or, uh, or any immigrants at all after all. Uh, so, uh, but probably I think the history will, will ap fully appreciate that quote of Angela Merkel that was really, I think, uh, very interesting and politicians maybe in future should, usually should be returning to that quote. There is interesting thing also with fear. She was not really the first leader that uh, wanted to prevent or wanted to, to, to tell people that they should not be feared. Maybe some of you remember Pope John, Ball, John Paul II. He was the first non-Italian Slavic Pope elected in 1978. And one of these, his first words after his elections were, do not be afraid. And these were the words that came from the, from the area or from the, the leader. At the time, nobody knew that he will be a real leader in a specific uh, point of view. But he came also from the Eastern countries. And also Angela Merkel came from the Eastern European society. So they really know what does it mean to be feared. 
because they know what is it to live uh, under the socialist regimes. But they really express that people should not be afraid. And I'm, and I'm uh, aiming at the fact that, uh, although the Pope even said that, that even churches as a real, really strong social agents, especially in Poland and maybe Slovakia, uh, were not also very welcoming uh, the immigrants. They rather stayed away, stayed calm in the situation, and usually, probably, they agreed with the decision of the politicians. Uh, I will maybe return to it later, but uh, generally, the, uh, the there is one thing how uh, these countries uh, perceive European Europe, European Union in terms of immigration, uh, as they would not agree with the politics. But on the other hand, these countries were very positive uh, EU, the most EU optimistic countries, especially in 2014 or maybe even 2015. Uh, if you see the, the countries are ordered uh, alphabetically, so very positive countries, for example, Poland, almost 50% fairly positive, which is uh, uh, quite uh, higher than the, the general average in European Union, which is the second bar. And uh, fairly negative Czech Republic, which are the biggest Eurosceptics in EU or the, the, in the Central Europe, but it, it's a long history. So you see that uh, even though they still somehow feel that EU sh should be something that uh, we should welcome and their politics should be our politics. Uh, some uh, uh, leaders from Western Europe were not very surprised by the fact that uh, these countries refused uh, the common policy towards immigrants and they somehow make uh, association that you acted like uh, people who came to a banquet or to a party and they left, e ate up everything and left. Sometimes you can see the, the association that these countries consider EU like ATM machine. They just come and withdraw the money and they leave. Because really there is a lot of money uh, coming into these countries. So this is very, very interesting. Uh, I just tried to uh, sum up. 70% of respondents of Poland even claim they fully understand how EU works. Hmm, who can believe it? <laughs> Never mind. Uh, but on the other hand, the, although the, the vision of EU as uh, ATM works very efficiently, uh, there are still some specific uh, specific problems that these countries are facing that are rather different from the problems of Western Europe. Uh, you can see, for example, for Czech Republic, immigration became a very big problem even in November 2015, uh, while the other countries did not consider that as a, such big issues. There are the issues such as unemployment. I'm not telling that in Western Europe there is no unemployment, but Eastern Europe or the transitive societies have experienced uh, very painful periods of unemployment rate, of high unemployment rates, rising prices. Uh, so very economic, very very ontological uh, issues that uh, people are are dealing. So uh, these are also this is the the uh, ex um, let's say excavation or somehow some snapshot of all the problems, all the fears that these societies have. So it, not, it really seems that these societies are formed by fear in general, not just by fear of, uh, fear of uh, let's say, uh, immigrants. Just some pictures. On the top, the, the Hero Square in Hungary, Budapest, the common meeting, and I think they were taking an oath to, to s they, will, they will serve the party, the Jobbik party, the far-right party in Hungary. There is the National Guard, or well, the National Guard, let's say the far-right party that entered Slovakian National Assembly. And you can see how the, the what are the rates for far-right parties, even in Western Europe, that it somehow become, uh, becomes very, very common. 
Sweden Democrats in Sweden or in Net uh, Netherlands or uh, Alternative for Deutschland, so they want to try something. We call them like anti-system system parties. They really try to... Uh, also on the other side, uh, the reasons besides the, the economic situation is the, is the form of education or, or the, the as there were very little or very little less money than expected that were coming to educational system, especially in those countries, um, the best teachers have fled education systems. So probably the education itself was not that as you one would expect. So the crisis in education also might have caused that these people really cannot perceive uh, the immigration issue in, in broader context, or they cannot perceive that these far-right parties will not solve anything at all. There is one, uh, it's from Slovakia, I will translate it. It's a, it's a school and the teacher is asking who knows something about Holocaust. And do you oh. see? <laughs> so, this is how the, uh, the two days ago, one of the, the cartoonists have perceived the connections between poor education system and how people perceive these far-right parties that beyond fight against immigrants, the, the, the general rhetorics is against Jews, is against Muslims, uh, again, generally non-Christian uh, or non-main Christian uh, denominations. So maybe just very few, the immigration issue in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, how very negative it was perceived, became perceived especially in Hungary, is not surprising after the experience they had with such amount of people. Slovakia, which almost uh, accepted no immigrants or Czech Republic as the most. So this is probably the end of my part. Uh, and I would like to, to end up with one thing that could be said in a broader context. Uh, as we see the, the, the fear or more or less existing fear of Islamization is, is, a, is an issue that can be perceived throughout the Europe, but especially in the Eastern Europe who, has, who have no experience with Islam. For example, the capital city of Slovakia is the last capital city in Europe without the mosque. Islam is not officially accepted religion in our country. That's very interesting. So people really can see uh, or have in, in, information about Islam just from fairy tales. One thousand and one night, if you remember, very famous fairy tales from Arabic world. Uh, and usually all the, the most recent uh, information about Islam are connected with the negative issues, uh, either in the uh, Western world or in the, the near, or near East. A very interesting reaction I have found in one uh, Czech magazine. If you are interested uh, in, or some of you might be interested in the religious landscapes throughout the Europe and you see that it's very complex, very perplexed. And Czech Republic or Czechia is one of the countries with the highest proportion of nuns, unbelievers. Almost three fourths of the country declare themselves they do not belong to any church, any denomination. Some say it's the most atheistic country beyond, before. then they uh, count this country to the countries like Cuba, China, and so on. And there was one very interesting uh, reaction of one author or one journalist that tried to, to put the context of what is happening uh, in Europe into the theories of clashes of civilizations of Samuel Hunt uh, Huntington. And he said that Europe has continuously abandoned the fact that it has grown up from Christian and Jewish roots. Not just Eastern, but let's say also Western in a way. Many Czechs are proud of being atheists and the permanent challenging of churches as a bodies, as a denominations, have pulverized our values, traditions and attitudes. 
There is not much from Christian essence left anymore. And we can see the same evolution in the whole Europe. It doesn't mean anything if one claims himself as a Christian. These are just blabbers because people even cannot imagine what it should mean for them to be a Christian. Because there is actually nothing left to adhere to, nothing to confess, because they don't know how. And on the other side stands steadfast and resolute Islam. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>